Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. I just feel like being down here on the floor today. I, I just feel like it. So we're going to do that. Okay. So starting in verse 9. It says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him, it's like one of my favorite scriptures on earth, and if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Truly, it's a lamp into our feet a light upon our path. Lord, your word says that the entrance of your word brings light. Lord, I pray today as your word goes forth, I pray, God, that you would anoint me to communicate that which you put in my heart today. God, that you would set captives free. You would change us, rearrange us, transform us, uh, transform us into the image of Jesus. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're talking today about a new obligation. And when you hear the word obligation, what does that mean to you? What, do you? what does that mean to you? You might think, oh, that guy fixed my car, so now I have to, of course you pay, but oh, now I owe him something. It's a feeling of owing or um, being indebted to somebody. And actually the real uh, definition of that right there is indebted to, one who owes another something, a debtor. And all of us have obligations, right? If you're married and have kids, you have an obligation to be a good wife. You have an obligation to raise those kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If you have a job and you want to get paid, hello, you have an obligation to go to work. And all of us have an obligation to the IRS can somebody say amen? <laughs> we got to pay our taxes. But in looking at the text here, the real question of life is who are you obligated to? Who are, your ob who are you obligated to? And as Christians, our highest obligation is to God, right? We've been looking, we've been, uh, Pastor Daniel's been in a series called Out with the Old, In with the New. He started the year off with, uh, unleashing the power of prayer and fasting. How many of you saw some breakthroughs as a result of that time? Yeah, I had some breakthroughs as well. He then spoke about vibing with your new fresh self. And if you want to know what that means, just find somebody who's under the age of 30 and they'll translate that for you. Amen? Right, Jake Butcher? Vibing with your new fresh self. That means it's, it's, it was this message about your identity. You can find all of these on YouTube. You can go to our Facebook page. And then last week, he, po he spoke one of the most, I, I just loved it. It was all about our new thinking, our new mind. We have the mind of Christ and what that looks like and how by taking our thoughts captive, by getting the word deep into our hearts, you can actually regroove your mind in the way you think, which is really important as a Christian because, well, for many reasons, and we'll talk about that here soon. And today we're talking about the new obligation. As Christians, we don't have an obligation anymore to our flesh, right? We have an obligation to live by the Spirit. And Paul is addressing, you all got notes? If you need notes, just raise your hand. One of our anointed ushers will uh, give you one. You got one, Cindy? Okay, good. Well, Paul addresses the Roman church and he affirms to them that because they're believers, they are now controlled, they're supposed to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit's work is tied to what Jesus did. Jesus died on the cross. He was raised again from the grave. 
after three days. The very same spirit that raised him from the dead is alive on the inside of us. When we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, his spirit comes into our bodies. He uh, comes into us. He, he dwells on the inside of us. And no longer are we dead in our trespasses and our sins, but we're made alive to God, right? And a picture of the Trinity is seen here. You can see that in verse uh, 9 through 11. And before you freak out and say, well, that word Trinity is not in the Bible. It's a, a term that's coined by uh, an early church father, Tertullian, uh, hopefully I'm saying his name right, but around the third century. And he's, it's a way of describing our three in one God, three distinct persons that make up the Godhead, God, the father, God, the son, God, the spirit, all God, all three different persons that make up the one God, right? And so he says it there in verse 9 to 11, you can see that. And he's saying here, Paul, that even though our bodies are destined to death because of sin, because we live in a fallen world, because of what Adam and Eve did and was lost in the garden, the fact that we have the presence of the Spirit of God on the inside of us means that we are going to have life now and forevermore. Glory to God. And the Spirit's work in us is threefold. Actually, the Holy Spirit does lots and lots of different things, but for today, and as we're talking about this text, we're gonna talk about three different things that he does. You know, the Holy Spirit's job is to make, uh, to glorify Jesus and help his people know him, reveal Jesus to us so that we can know him and live for him. But the first thing that in our notes there that he does is he sanctifies us. At salvation, we're regenerated. That means that you receive Jesus, you pray that prayer, you repent of your sins, he comes in, washes, in you, washes you and cleanses you and makes your dead spirit alive to God once again. And he makes Jesus real to us. He, one, one author, or one person said, he presses home to our hearts the truth, righteousness, majesty, beauty, goodness, and compassion, and the love of Christ. He, Christ. he makes that known to us so we can experience that. And then he begins the not so good feeling, <laughs> doesn't always feel good to our flesh, but he starts to be, uh, transforming us, changing us into the image of Jesus, sanctifying us, making us more like Christ, putting, helping us to put to death, you know, speaking to us, put his, his finger on things in our lives that he doesn't like and saying, hey, you need to change that. We learn how to forgive, how to walk in holiness. And eventually the, the fruit of the spirit begins to become very evident in our lives, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control and some other things that I probably forgotten there. And we begin to work, grow in the wisdom and knowledge of God sanctification. And secondly, he gives, uh, he gives life. He quickens our mortal body and we can receive healing. In the altar, if I've ever prayed for you, you'll, you'll know that scripture in Romans 8 right there, that the very same spirit, think about that for a moment. I think I don't think about that enough. The very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive inside of you and gives life. I mean, think about that. I've struck, I've, I'm getting healed in Jesus' name. I've had type one diabetes for 51 years. I, I just think, you know, your spirit's inside of me. Resurrect that pancreas and make it work in Jesus' name. I probably need to think about that a little bit more and, and declare that. Any, anybody know what I mean? That's, that's intense. The very same spirit dwells on the inside of us. And ultimately, we're going to get a new body, a resurrected body like Jesus. We don't have to worry about how many carbs we eat. Hallelujah. Anybody? We don't have to worry about that we're too fat, we're too skinny. We don't have to worry about all that stuff. We don't have to worry about high blood pressure. We're going to get a glorified body. Amen. Paul in verse 12 says, For that reason, therefore... Consequently, we have an obligation to live indebted as spirit people. That sounds kind of weird, right? But no, that what I'm saying is, is that you are a spirit that is having an earthly experience 
We are indebted to God in light of all that he's done for us. We have a debt. We owe him a debt. We are indebted. We have a new obligation. Somebody say new obligation. We have a new obligation to live by the spirit as a people of the spirit. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19, Paul says, Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Ephesians 4.22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to being made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We've been set free. We've been set free by the Holy Spirit and by the work of Jesus on the cross. Amen. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Galatians 5.24. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but it's Christ that lives in me. Romans 6, verse 6 through 7. There are so many scriptures. You should do a word study on crucifying your flesh. It's very powerful, and it'll affect you. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died, and we died with Jesus when we received him as Lord and Savior on the cross, right? We died, and we got new life with him. Anybody that's died has been set free from sin. And guess what? You might not always feel like it, I don't care. Notice that Paul's not talking just to brand new. I mean, in this case, the Roman church is kind of a brand new church. But he's not talking all over the scriptures about that. He's talking to every single person. Because I don't care how old you are, whether you've been living for, you know, saved for a very long time, or whether you're just a brand new Christian, the truth is the same. You might not feel like it. <clears throat> I'm doing this Bible study and by, with Neil Anderson. And I want to say that if you struggle with sin, like, hello, I think all of us do in different areas, you know, attitudes. I'm not just talking about sexual sin or life controlling sin. I'm talking about everything. Powerful material on how to overcome sin and, and get your mind right and get your thoughts right. And he gave this example of yeah, it's not just clothing yourself with Christ, putting on something on the outside, making your body obey. It doesn't matter how you feel. You've been changed on the inside. We're different. We're different. We're changed. We're new. It doesn't matter how you feel. You've got to stand on that truth, right? It's by faith. And I think of the example of a baby that's in the womb, and then and there, there you have that reality, that's their reality, all warm and cozy, and you don't have to worry about anything, really. And then they're born. <laughs> well, it's a great thing, okay? I make it sound terrible, but no, they're born. They're born again. It's a brand new reality. It's the same thing with us. It's a totally different reality when we're born again. It's totally brand new, total different life experience. And our gratefulness for what God has done, because of it, we should yield to the work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. We should live as spirit people. Jonathan Edwards, a great revivalist and theologian of a long, from a long time ago, Puritan, he said of the Holy Spirit, I just love this. It, it is so profound. He said, the Holy Spirit is not merely a spectator of the atonement, but he's the thing that was purchased. The Holy Spirit is the love of God poured out into the hearts of the saints, uniting them to the Father and the Son. In other words, the direct and immediate presence of the Holy Spirit within the believer is grace. That's God's grace. And because of that grace, out of gratefulness for what he has done for us, we need to live as a people ruled by our spirits and not by our flesh. We must put to de death the misdeeds of the body by the Spirit. Romans 6, verses 11 through 12 says, in the same way, reckon yourselves dead to sin. I love that word. It just sounds so like Western. <laughs> reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
That word reckon means count yourself, like count yourself dead to sin. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. God speak to, speaking to us this morning. There's, we're under new management. We're brand new. And there's an idiom, American idiom, called there's a new sheriff in town. There's a new sheriff in town. And you know, when you think about that, you, you think about a Western. Anybody like Western movies in here? Yeah, Pastor Daniel, he may not admit it, but he loves, he loves Western movies. We love them, those old Westerns. And you imagine a, a town that has criminals doing whatever they want. Complete lawlessness, debauchery, drinking, people killing each other, and there's no justice there's no law. And then suddenly, well, I'm not going to make the music sound, do, 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 you know. <laughs> All of a sudden, you see this gunslinger, and it's the new sheriff. It's the new sheriff. There's a new sheriff in town, and he's come to bring law. He's come to bring order. He's come to throw away all the things that are old. And there's a new law in town, and he cleans up the whole mess. That's what it's like. That's what it's like, and we're supposed to live like that. We're talking about out with the old and in with the new. In with a new way of, of thinking, like last week he talked about. And today, a new obligation as Christians. And you might say today, well, how do I live in this? How do I keep this new obligation? How do I keep this thing? Well, first thing you have to do is position yourself for victory. Listen, know the word and obey it. The book of James says, don't just be a hearer of the word, but you got to do the word. Listen, you believe Jesus for your salvation, right? And if you haven't, if you haven't given your life to Jesus before, we're going to do that at the end of this service coming up soon. But if you are, you, we are all here because we've, uh, many of us have received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We believed by faith according to the word. Well, it's the same way with every single other area in our lives. Don't just take that. Take every single area. you got to know the word. His word is alive and it's active. If you sit and you study the word, if you, I mean, I like paper. I'm not a big screen person. I mean, I definitely spend a lot of time on screens. However, I love to do word studies. I love to write down scriptures that pertain to the same thing. I love to do that, like getting a hold of your tongue about the character of God, about uh, his kindness, his love, who I am in Christ. I love those things. And when you do that and you meditate on those things, man, you get changed on the inside because the word of God is living. It like shakes you. I mean, that's my experience is that it, there's, it like begins to shake and do something on the inside of me. Pastor Daniel talked last week about, according to Dr. Carolyn Leaf, it takes 66 days to change the groove in your mind, to change your thinking, and then 44 days of practice. That sounds like a really long time, <laughs> but... Literally, you have to take the word, and he, he likened it to a dog where you, you know, dogs, a lot of dogs don't like baths. You put that dog between your legs, and you, you wash that thing. You wash your mind with the water of the word. Well, you know what that looks like? For me, literally, what I do, when I have a thought, I, grab, I say, no, I see it. I know the word, and I just instantly, I pull that thing down and replace it with the word of God. You, I just speak the word over that situation. A long time ago... When I was struggling in my flesh, trying to get a hold of my flesh, learning about who God was, learning about all these different things, learning how to do this, I just felt like a psycho because the war and the battle in my mind was so strong. Like every second of the day, I would wake up and it was like the war was on. It was instant hand-to-hand -hand combat from the moment I woke up. I came out of the occult and everything that I had learned and all the things from my past just wanted to pull me back in there. But I knew that I had been touched by God. I knew that Jesus was real. And I made a choice to follow him, but the battle was so strong. So I would do something that looked crazy. I would literally get on my running shoes. I lived in Hawaii. I lived on Maui, so not gonna do that here and freeze to death. <clears throat> 
but I would get on my shoes and I would grab a hold of one. I just took one scripture because it was the only one that I could memorize at that time. I said, trust in the Lord. I would get on my shoes and I would just run because it would exhaust my flesh. I'd put my flesh down and I would just scream that scripture. I must have looked like a total nut job running all around Maui down the streets of Kihei. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. I mean, I would have to literally do that. If you're battling something, find out what the word says about it and, and stand on the fact that you're a spirit. You're a spirit being and your spirit is alive to God. Your flesh is dead, crucified on the cross. Keep it there and fight with the word, fight with the word. In positioning yourself for victory, you have to pray, pray. <laughs> It doesn't have to be all formal. Just talk to God. Talk to him and listen to what he says. Don't just fill all your prayer time. I mean, there's definitely different types of prayer styles, and we're doing all kinds of those here at our 24-7 prayer. But, man, talk to God. He knows what's up. And, and not only that, all he's, uh, uh, he said in 1 John, he said, Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. He's ready, willing, and able to help you. The spirit of God that's dwelling on the inside of you is ready to help. Amen. We need to yield to the Holy Spirit. He didn't leave us as orphans. He didn't leave us. He knew that we were going to need power to overcome our flesh and power to overcome the enemy. He sent us a power. He sent us a guide, a comforter, somebody who leads us and guides us into all truth. And we need to submit to his leadership. I have a story. Long time ago, before I uh, gave my life to Christ, I went to Nepal. I had the great blessing and privilege of going to Nepal, which is a little tiny country in between China and Tibet uh, in the foot of the Himalayan mountains. And I was there for about a month and learned how to read and write Sanskrit and all kinds of other things. But uh, one of the things that we did while we were there is we went trekking. And if you don't know what trekking is, it's where basically you spend however long uh, going from village to village all across certain parts of the Himalayan mountains. It was incredible. I mean, it was amazing. It was 10 days. I felt like I was at, up Mount Everest, even though I think we only got to about nine or 10,000 feet because the weather was funky. We walked, we had a guide, uh, a Sherpa who took us and we would go from village to village. So we'd wake up in the morning, we'd eat rice and lentils, dalbat, and we would go and we would hike all day long. And there was literally nothing, no, no villages, just these little obscure homes out in the middle of no, I mean, who knew how to find those things? I mean, they were just suddenly at the end of the day, we would show up and there, there, there would be the house. The most incredible scenery. I mean, things that you would never imagine. Uh, what's that thing that's in the north? Hot springs, pools with mountains and cliffs, jungles, incredibly scary jungles with large snakes and things. And I was so thankful for that guide because I didn't know where the heck I was. And if I was alone, it wasn't going to be a good thing. He knew where the tigers were that attacked people. You don't want to go over there. He knew different things. He knew the direction. He didn't even have a map. Well, one day we were walking in the middle of that trek. And we came near this ravine. I mean, very intense jungle vibes very intense jungle and I looked down and there was the deepest ravine that you can in the middle of the jungle like shouldn't that be out on a mountain where a cliff is or something but it was this ravine like you couldn't even see the bottom it was so scary and the grass this was the scarier part is the grass looked like something had been gone over the edge of that like all that big tall grass was laying down like you could tell something had gone over the edge and he told us this this what what happens there's a lot of people that visit Nepal and they go trekking. And there's, they go with these guides. And there are times when people go off because they wanna take pictures or they see something that's really cool and they wanna get whatever. 
And they get separated from the rest of the group. So the group moves on, these people get separated. And a couple things happen. They get eaten by tigers. There's bands of thieves and marauders, which is a very real thing, that attack, steal people's stuff, and push them over cliffs. That's a real thing. And they wait, just like the devil, for you to get separated from your guide. And I'm going to tell you something. That's exactly how life without living by the Spirit is. If you don't, he's there. We choose. We choose whether we're going to submit to the guide and the leader. We choose whether we're going to follow that hiking, per, that guide, or we're going to go off and be like, oh, yeah. And they say at the beginning of the hike, don't, don't, don't go off by yourself. Don't go. Stay with the group. There's a reason. <laughs> There's a reason they give you instructions. It's so you don't end up dead. And that's just like the devil. He wants you to be dead. He wants you to be dead in sin. He hates you. He hates your children. He hates God, and he wants to do everything he can to bring you to hell. He wants to do that. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you know, the Holy Spirit reminded me of another experience I had in Nepal. After we'd been done trekking at some point, we came to this place where inside of a very well-fortified cage, for which I was very thankful, there was a tiger that had just been caught. One of those man, and they caught him because he was a man-eater. He ate people. There is, anybody ever seen a lion or a tiger that's not been at the zoo, that's been caught in a cage? That thing was so fearsome and terrifying, and it was angry and hungry, and it wanted to, it, it, the roar, its screams filled. And that cage wasn't big enough for me, I'll tell you what. I was right next to that cage, and I, was, I wanted to get away from there as fast as possible. Don't open the door to the enemy. Don't open the door to the enemy. He's a roaring lion. He's a, he's a tiger. He's a, he wants to devour you. And that stuck with me <laughs> today as the Holy Spirit reminded me of that. I was like, that is a perfect example. We have to choose life. To fulfill this new obligation that we have, we must choose life. We have to put to death the misdeeds of our body. Who cares what your flesh wants to do? Who cares? Tell it to shut up. Galatians 6 verse 8 says, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit is going to reap eternal life. Just don't do it. Do the opposite of what Nike says. Just don't do it, right? This is a war. You're in a war. Whether you like it or not, you're a Christian. You're, you're in a spiritual war. And you can roll over and play dead. We cannot be passive. Passivity is not a kingdom quality. To be passive is to abstain from resistance and yield to either influence, uh, internal or external uh, influences. He's a roaring lion. Cut things off from your life. Just say, cut it off. Look at your neighbor and say, cut it off. <laughs> Romans 13, 14 says, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh with regards to its lust. Do you know what that means, that word provision? Okay, we live in Alaska. Hello. We have a winter weather advisory. It's going to snow again tonight. We're, none of us are going to lose our power, thank the Lord, because there's not going to be any wind in Jesus' name, right? But we make provisions for those kind of things just in case. Just in case we've got lighters, maybe you have a generator, maybe you've got some extra water bottles laying around. And, and we, we're, we do this as Alaskans. We have extra stuff, provisions in case there's an issue. It's planning just in case. Well, Paul is saying, don't make provision for your flesh. Give it no chance. Don't plan something. It's, another version says, it says, don't think about or plan on how to grat gratify the lust of your flesh, the desires of your flesh. Don't think about it and don't plan it. Instead, plan not to. Cut it off. Cut it off. 
Don't put yourself in circumstances where your flesh is going to fall. Don't surround yourself. Don't listen to things. Don't look at things. Plan not to. Cut it off. <laughs> Cut it off. If you know you're going to go somewhere and you're going to stumble, listen, if you ever, if you're a single person and you go off together with somebody else to be alone, that's usually, I mean, you have to guard yourself against doing something that might not be the best for you. That's going to activate your flesh. Peel that dead guy off the, off the cross. Cut it off. Go on a date. Pastor Daniel and I, we used to go to the gym. We'd go to restaurants. We went and served God. We went to Bible studies. We did everything that we could to be together safely so we would not fall. Cut it off. Worship team, would you come? We're getting ready to conclude here. And as, as we do, as God's people, we have a new obligation to be controlled by the Holy Spirit inside of us, not our fleshy desires. And in doing so, we will live the life that God has paid for us to have. Jesus paid with his blood for us to have a, life, a good life. We can live by the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I love what 2 Peter verses 1, 3 to 4 says. It says, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. Hello? Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. He's given us everything that we need. He made our spirit new. He's given us his word so that we can know, so we can know how we're supposed to live. And if you'll take the time as somebody who professes the name of Jesus to get to know the word, to grow in the wisdom and knowledge of God, to know who you truly are, you will live a life to the full. You won't submit to the lust of the flesh. You'll see it coming and you'll be like, nope, I'm done. Cut it off. You'll cut it off before it happens. Attitudes. I'm, I'm talking about everything, not just sexual sin, everything. Attitudes, thoughts. We have to position ourselves for victory. We have to know the word. We have to do the word. We've got to pray, have a relationship with God in the Holy Spirit. We have to yield to the, uh, the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. His leadership, submit to his ways. When he says, don't do it, don't do it. And these things are a process sometimes, you know? You gotta learn how to do all this stuff. That's why we're teaching you how to do this, amen? Choose life, put to death the misdeeds of the body, put to death those, those carnal desires that, you're, that, that happen. Don't be passive, be very intentional. Be intentional about living in the spirit, about living holy. God wants us to live holy. He doesn't want us to forfeit. He, just keep that door shut, keep that tiger in the cage. Cut off things that are gonna make you stumble or that do make you stumble and make no provision for your flesh. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast and it's enriched you and helped you in your life. If you've never made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you do it now? Pray this prayer with me right out loud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place. Thank you that he rose again from the grave for me. Forgive me of all of my sin. Wash me, cleanse me and make me new. Thank you for loving me, and thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Let me pray for you. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would touch each and every person that prayed that prayer out of sincerity of heart. I pray a breaking off of every assignment of darkness, any chain, any bondage, any habit that's not of God, that you would sever it and set them free. I pray and ask, Holy Spirit, touch them, 
and fill them now and use them for your purpose and give them a hunger for your word and for the things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, text us, would you, so that we can help you grow in the things of God. Text SAVED to the number 907 357 2065. If you don't have a home church, we hope that you would find a home with us here at Kings, Alaska. If you're in some other part of the nation or the world, find a good local church that preaches and teaches God's word and grow in the things of God. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you in future broadcasts or in services. Praise the Lord.